I would like to introduce now to you uh, Sylvia Lorik, um, who works at the C Sustainable Europe Research Institute. <laughs> What is all research, of course. She heads the institute in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, she has a PhD in consumer economics. I don't know if that's known here, consumer economics as a PhD, but at least you have one. And you focus, of course, your research is completely on consumption. You work a lot with NGOs also, uh, also working as a policy consultant. And um, you will take the systemic perspective and in particular also this idea of strong sustainable consumption. I'm looking forward, Sylvia, to what you are going to tell us. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad that I'm here. I'm really proud to be here and I'm totally happy that you are here as well. <laughs> so, the title of my speech is From Green Consumerism to Strong Sustainable Consumption. And I like to go to uh, within the next 40 minutes to tell you some facts about sustainable consumption, some you have heard already. I like to introduce to you some concepts how to approach sustainable consumption. And as Dan was doing, I like to adjust the focus as well. From weak sustainable consumption, you will learn what it is in the next uh, half an hour towards strong sustainable consumption. So, let's start. So, the, my first part is on some understandings or misunderstandings of sustainable consumption. At least those of you who are studying in this course, I hope you still know that Agenda 21 was the document um, developed and um, agreed upon at the Rio conference in 1999. Who, who knows about that? Oh, it's more the older ones than the younger ones, <laughs> naturally. Um, so, and um, it, it clearly points out that sustainable consumption deals with environmental problems, but also deals with poverty deals with development, deals with imbalance. And coming from the uh, Rio conference, the first big um, international gatherings with um, ministers and uh, head of states on especially sustainable consumption, not sustainability in general, but uh, sustainable consumption, was in um, 1994. Uh, and it also pointed out that sustainable consumption is about basic needs. It's about quality of life. And then it has to do with resource use as well, and it looked for further into future generations. So sustainable consumption has an environmental aspect. And I'm coming from the European discourse, so I'm talking a lot about the environmental perspective, but it also has a development aspect. There's an equity aspect. If I'm talking about sustainable consumption, I'm talking about people, I'm talking the well-being of people. And in this, resource use is an important aspect. I like to start with a task for you. Just consider, you will get a minute, if someone asks you for an advice how to consume sustainable. What would you give as a typical recommendation? Think a minute and best write it down on a piece of paper. Because we will come back to that later. First, I'd like to guide you a little bit to my experience in working on sustainable consumption issues for 20 years. It took me a while, but I had to figure out that if people are talking about sustainable consumption, they have quite different ideas what sustainable, what consumption is about. What consumption, which consumption? Whose consumption? A quite broad range of um, person, of people, of researchers as well, mainly concentrate on individual consumption, on household consumption. Then what we discuss there is consumption habits, 
and all the items, the equipment you have in your households and how to optimize that. A second approach is if you talk to um, economists because their consumption is just the opposite of production. Things are produced and they are consumed and in the best case through markets both fit together. So here consumption is not only what we as households and as individuals consume but also public consumers have a major impact, are the major consumers. Think of all the infrastructure for motorways, ways for uh, trains, but also the university, the school systems, hospitals, whatever, and through public procurement, indeed public consumers can influence a lot towards more sustainability. And then there is a third group of people if they talk about consumption, they clearly have resource consumption in mind. And then we realize that also business is a consumer because they consume the resources, they transfer in goods and services in the end for private and public consumers. May you like to consider which is your idea of consumption you have mainly in mind. Think for yourself, but don't forget, if you talk about that, others might come from the other area. So what I like to plea and what I like to advertise uh, tonight is that if we talk about sustainable consumption, not to forget or always to emphasize the resource consumption effect as well. Because if we don't do that, we can easily get lost talking about marginal things. We have still the discussion on the plastic bags. There is still the discussion on switch off the light if you leave the room, on the um, charges for the mobile phone. But these are really little things. And the problem with concentrating and promoting the little things again and again and again through this hundred tips to behave more sustainable is that that gets into the mind of people. And they easily think, oh, if I'm doing that, I'm uh, contributing to sustainability already, which is not really the case. So what I'm missing is clearly examples like that that people with, the, with easy tools get a better feeling what matters and what doesn't matter. So just as an example. So why do we have to drastically res to reduce resource consumption? Because we are running out of a lot of non-repletable resources, also uh, the the renewable resources like fish or land are coming to short stages. I don't want to go into all these details I have given there, just, just as a reminder that this knowledge is out there already. <coughs> what I like to, to put the finger on is the development of the Earth Overshoot Day. So may, you may have heard that the Global Footprint Network for some years is calculating every year at which day the resources, in theory, which should be available for one year, are consumed already. And you see from the line, it's getting earlier and earlier. And what is the most concerning is they started in the year when the Bundland report was published. The first global report where global policymakers used the term sustainable development broadly for the first time. In that year, we still were more or less in a, in, on, on the good side, managed to live on the resources available. And since then, all the talking, all the work, all what happened was valuable, but hasn't changed the picture. 
So the situation is rather dramatic. So what I see behind this hmm, scissor of um, we know and we don't do, things are still developing wrong, is there is the model of our economy, so to say. Oh, there, are, there are three models, there are three explanations. I would say we are still rather in the unsustainable area. So money makes the world go round. I think this is, a lot of you still agree, or it's, it's a saying that is often confirmed. Yes, we have to see it like that. Money is the fact. The economy is driving everything. And then we have these Mickey Mouse ears. Yeah, we could care about social and we could care about uh, the environment. But if you read Wall Street's journals, I don't think too much is in there. So what is the approach? In context of sustainability is to bring the social and the environmental aspect to a similar size at least in, in the perception, uh, as the economic one. Unfortunately, this leads us, if at all, to a less unsustainable stage. Even if you always say it's the word sustainability, in fact, mainly, it's only less unsustainable. I have, oh, I have some arrows here. You see the first part is the business as usual. And I think it's still, unfortunately, business as usual today. The next approach is what is um, tried by those people coming from a perspective of um, environmental economics. In environmental economics, still economics is in the center, the economic modeling is in the center, and they try to bring environmental aspects in, in, in a better way. What is needed to come sus to true sustainability? Staying in the limits is an approach of ecological economics. The names might sound similar, environmental economics and ecological economics, but there is a fundamental difference within it. Because ecological economics try to turn the picture, and you see it here. Ecological economics argue very clearly that the nature is setting our boundaries. You might be able to discuss with economies, but definitely not with Mother Earth, not with the nature. It has the same. And within nature, societies are um, a subsystem. We humans, how we organize ourselves. And within the societies, the economies are a subsystem, something we can influence. And this is something um, not business as usual at the moment. It's really the paradigm shift. And now that brings me back to the question I have asked to you. I, I have a ball kind of thing here I wanted to throw around. But maybe the easiest, the easiest is if I, if I, can I, can I ask all you sitting here to come up with what you have written down or what you have in mind on what to say, what to give as a recommendation for sustainable consumption. Just expect here is the strong sustainability approach. And there is the business as usual. With your recommendation, what do you think? If your recommendation would be fully to 100% fulfilled, how far have you come from this business as usual to the strong sustainability? Can I ask you to come up and to go here? Yes, I like to hear. Thank you. No, that's my. Oh, 
That would be my question. Do you really need it? Do you really need it? Uh, that's my recommend. Yeah. But you would put a question to the person. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, I think you're standing quite fine. <laughs> what would be your recommendation? I guess it's a little bit similar of the, uh, with the pre previous presentation, is make rational choices. Make rational choices. So not not the kind of culture or habit kind of thing, mm -hmm. but really like think clearly. For example, everyone is like at the same time in the traffic jam in an own car. I mean, own car, so one person instead of five persons or mm -hmm. something. And we're all g going from basically Antwerp to Brussels. So everyone is like moving in the same direction. If you like clearly think about it, it makes more sense to let's say carpooling, for example, and everyone yeah. knows that, but no, nobody does it basically. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you put me really in a, in, a, in a challenge at the moment. I keep you where you are. I like to hear from the ladies. <laughs> I'm thinking because? But I was thinking the same thing. So you influence them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, any, anyone with a practical recommendation? Consuming what you need and not going in overflow. I think I have to put you back on your seat. I thank you very much. You are too advanced for this game. <laughs> the, 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 the point is, what, what, I, what, I, what I normally get, what I normally get very typical suggestions is what I already said. Switch off the light. Buy the energy efficient appliances. Avoid the plastic bags. This is what people are still recommending to, 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 the, to their fellows, to their peers. And even, even school teachers tell their, their pupils, their students, oh yeah, avoid the waste. After 20 years of research, um, <clears throat> that avoiding waste is good, but it's a starter only. So this is nice. Do that. Don't stop doing it. Don't, but don't think... We will, we will save the, the world with that. So less typical suggestions are care for good isolation, you know, all the energy saving things. Take a shower, not a bath, or shower with a friend, however you like it. Um, low, lo, lower um, the, the room temperature, or if you're in a southern country, higher the room temperature. And then, then we are more or less on a less unsustainable stage. But what is rarely considered, but much, much more important, is to, to, to live on less square meter. So the individual, the, the tendency to have a lower, a smaller families, lots of single households who live on, in, in, in normal flats, not sharing kitchens anymore. Then we do reduce animal products, but also avoid car use and flights. These, these are things that indeed matter. And here comes for the first time the separation I made. So all, all the, 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 the upper points, where we are still in a situation where we not seriously, not honestly can talk about sustainable consumption. Not sustainable, but less unsustainable. And my plea with the strong sustainable consumption, for me, strong sustainable consumption is the only thing would, which would deserve the word sustainable consumption. So fortunately, Dan has put it out uh, already. So there is a state-of-art knowledge on sustainable consumption research. He has put it out. It's housing, it's food, mobility. These are the things which matter. We know that for 20 years. What is not state-of-the-art is questions. We have a lot of questions which still have to be researched or better to take account of. So who, who, who should take the initiative? I think the um, practice approach gives quite indication who shall take initiatives. Do technologies offer solutions or are they future problems? 
So we have the LED lamp, which is so efficient. Uh, I'm sitting on a nice window looking out on a, on a pathway where the joggers are going along and the dogs. And now the dogs all have these LED lamps around there. Yeah, you know, I don't know what the name is. And the joggers have the LED shoes. So what's the point of having a new technology if it is uh, used for useless things, just more of them? Um, so the question of informing, nudging or consumers or just putting regulations, what helps best? Totally underestimated the question, who has the power in the system? Whom to influence, whom, whom to get in contact with, really to make changes. Um, social in the, in innovations, we talk a lot, a lot about technological innovation, but social innovations are also um, to, yeah, to, to question, to speed up, to, to see how they can uh, make a difference. And for me, it's also, is growth a problem or a solution? And even if we do everything, do we manage to stay within the planetary boundaries? So I bring you two concepts, food for thoughts, how to pave the way to sustainable consumption, to strong sustainable consumption, to something which really can be called sustainable consumption. One is the environmental space concept, and the one is um, uh, it's, it's a pathways to strong sustainable consumption. Let me start with the environmental space concept. That's how it looks like. We have poverty, we have needs, and I learned from the presentation um, Eric gave that the unsustainable part, the, the blue one, is not only in the developing countries, as we could assume, but is also more and more in our countries as well as well as we have uh, the global consumer class. Half of, more than half of the global consumer class is in developed, developing countries by now. So it's not a north-south thing anymore, but within countries as well. So doesn't it look like, doesn't it look um, worth to achieve that we all live in a good way in, in, in the green field? I haven't made the colors, but. So, the, the flora, or linea de dignity, oh, I can't say it, so, <laughs> to live a dignified life, you know, a life worth living. You not have shelter and food only, but you also have access to, to social interaction, access to, to health system, a minimum income, not only subsistence, <coughs> but you also can buy something on the markets. So this would be criteria to come above, otherwise you don't live, can't live sustainable. It's more difficult with the, with the ceiling. On one hand, it's the maximum, maximal tolerable resource use and the environmental damage. There are some approaches pointing to that. At least the formal agreement to limit global warming to two degrees could be seen as a ceiling. Unfortunately, the climate doesn't read newspapers or declarations. Um, so it's a bit vague. So a bit more concrete was the approach for 2000 Watt Society, which was invented in Switzerland some time ago. So it gives an orientation how much every person could use and what would be overuse. Um, there is a concept of the safe operating space you, uh, you can't really see. So whatever is read there means we have overstretched our limits already. Uh, there are few individual studies on automobility, on meat consumption, on water use, which shows what is above, what, what, what would be too much, or what would be uh, a share that would be fair if everyone on earth would live on that. Hmm? Or 
just imagine a production quota for, for, for meat. This could be one approach how to make sure that we don't go above the ceiling. What is interesting then is the size. How big is the green field? And then we see it depends. So for the um, State of the World um, report, um, um, Eric, is Eric as well, right? Eric um, uh, Asadurian uh, has calculated the amount of people and the, the income level, so to say. How many people then could live on Earth? To make it to, to stay into in, in within planetary boundaries, so to say, and it says if everyone would live on a low on a level like the low income countries, the Earth could tolerate uh, 13 billion people, and if it would be on the level of the United States with the income, it would be 1.4 billion people. This goes more or less back to the um, iPad formula, which hopefully some of you have heard, which said that the impact of the environment is just a factor of the population of affluence of technology. So we want the impact to go down. I think you agree. What we know most likely, if we don't get a major pandemic, Population is going up. It's fair to calculate that way and not to hope uh, <clears throat> for a natural solution. So what the proponents of weak sustainable consumption promote is increasing affluence because they say we need growth and growth will bring new technology and everything can be brighter and nicer if the economy grows, and then we will solve all the problems. And you know, growth, GDP growth means more money for the people, more affluence. So that means that everything depends on technology. Will the perpetuum mobile be invented? Might be. Might be we, we find the brilliant energy solution and we don't have to have evenings like this anymore. But maybe not. Maybe not. So I'm, I'm pleased to be on the safe side and to yeah, work on the other aspects as well. Oh. It says what I just said. So, just imagine we are in this upper border, on the unsustainable high consumption area, and we like to go towards to, to, to the green sustainability field. Well, maybe, maybe it stops here. This is not sustainable anymore. I like to make you thinking again for three minutes. But now you can chat with your neighbor. OK? Uh, oh, no. Uh, the, the question is, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the question is, if, if, you, if you start in the, the upper left field, what do you think the pathway would look like to arrive on the sustainable point or area? That was clear now, yeah? No? Was it clear? You, you start at the big house in the unsustainable field and you think just design in your head a pathway, a graph to that area. And again, I give you three minutes. Three minutes are gone. 
sorry for interrupting hopefully intensive debates. Unfortunately, this is a lecture, not a seminar. So I don't ask you again <laughs> to, to, to give me um, feedback or give me your impressions. I'm, I'm just going through, again, typical answers which are given. So you see all four lines. Which make us, uh, which which are used here. The one is the one, the the, the first with the blue arrow at the moment. The red, the orange orange one, is the argument of ecological modernization. They say that we have to invest into <coughs> technology now, even if it costs more resources at the moment, but that will pay out because in the end we can very straight go down with energy consumption, resource consumption, towards a sustainable area. Um, the second is the argumentation of environmental economics. So we try not to further increase our resource consumption, but go down <coughs> slowly, keep it stable. If we manage to keep it stable, we are on the good way already. And then it will go down sooner or later. The green line is the argumentation of the degrowth debate. Because they say we can't rely that resource consumption will go down due to better technology, other technologies. We simply don't know. And to be on the safe side, let's, let's go down with resource consumption immediately, as fast as possible. Only that will bring us on, on the right way. And finally, this is business as usual. If we go on with what we are doing, it will come to an end. Make up your mind which line you be believe or uh, found, found, found the more, most logical. I, I confess for me it's the green one, but there are good arguments for the others as well. And interestingly, oh yeah, interestingly, looking from the other side is not too developed in sustainable consumption research, and this is the perspective I'm looking on nearly everything. We know the unsustainable, underconsuming parts of the society have to increase to become sustainable, and then there is, yeah, just. Less, less evidence, less research-based solutions or pathways here. But interestingly, the green line going directly up is would be the degrowth perspective, because degrowth doesn't mean everyone has to degrow, but some has, have to degrow tremendously for others to come up. Um, the blue line, I have to look here. The blue line and the orange line would be some kind of leapfrogging. Frogging. So bring the new technology, the more efficient technology to the developing <coughs> countries, really broadly said, and, and hope they don't make the same mistakes as we do. And finally, the business as usual or the growth path most likely will bring us to a more unsustainable situation resource in, in, in terms of resource use and efficiently in, in efficiency, but not necessarily will bring those people up to a, to a higher consumption level. But this is not as solidly researched, as I said, as the other areas are. So, 
I pointed out several times that a lot of things which are out in the debate are, in fact, if at all weak sustainable consumption, green consumerism, or even better to say, <coughs> less unsustainable consumption. While we should really start considering a bit more strong sustainable consumption. And I like to, to, to bring different kinds of thinking, of approaches. I compare them here. So in, in weak sustainable consumption, we are talking about efficiency, efficiency, efficiency all the time. Um, so there is the goal to have 20% of efficiency within the European Union between 2012 and 2020. Unfortunately, this efficiency doesn't mean we use less resources, 20% less resources. It's just 20% compared to a growth path without efficiency. So, in fact, we, we might end up with the, with the same energy use. So efficiency is not what a na naive person could think that we are using less. The growth aspect is always calculated in. So the opposite to that was nothing against efficiency, but please start thinking about sufficiency as well. And this was fortunately discussed in another course, in another evening already, at least mentioned. So we have the relative decoupling or decoupling, which means resource consumption, energy consumption shouldn't be go in the same way as GDP. But still, even if it goes, grows slower than the economy, it's still growing. So what we need is an absolute reduction to stay within the, the limits. We are so much talking about green products. I've, lots of things in, in sustainable consumption is about products, services, it's things on the market. But what would be important was to look into sustainable lifestyles. What makes you happy? What is important that, that, that correlates to the quality of life? Thing. What makes your life important? Is it the products? Is it something else? So I, I hear this peeping, this is to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I only pick, you can read everything, you will get it anyway. All, all of this is worth a day of seminar anyway. Um, what, what I like to highlight, highlight here is um, the quality of life. I always plea for a good life, thinking about a good life. Because in a lot of arguments on sustainable consumption, on sustainability, you have the better life, the better life for all, the better life for the people. What's the point with the better life? Then you earn a better life, and then you want a better life. And then you're looking for the better life. So where is the good life? When do you arrive at a stage where you feel well? So this only happens if you get out of the street mill and, 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 and think about products and services. Yeah, that was, I'm focusing on <laughs> the one situation. Um, and again, this brings me back to the technology um, aspect and, and to different thinking. So if our policy approaches go on with trying to optimize or trying to achieve weak sustainable consumption through more technology and all this, then we might that, that might lead that we are living in the misery for most because we don't get the technological solution. So only if we start as soon as possible with policies approaching some uh, strong sustainable consumption, then we might end up with a balanced living for most. And just in case we really invent the technology, then we have a high human well-being for most. That would be great. Not a balance, but a high. So however technology develops, to be on the safe side, the precautionary principle is to go towards strong sustainable consumption policies. That's it. Thank you for your attention.